Welcome everyone to a new episode of Genuine Rockstars and today's Genuine Rockstar is Vincent Fernandez. Thank you so much for joining us today, Vincent. How are you? Hi, uh, good. Could you tell our audience a little bit about who you are and what you do? I'm working at the European Synchrotron in Grenoble. I'm a paleontologist and I've specialized in using X-ray computed tomography to scan many things, but mostly fossils. Or let's say I prefer to scan fossils. You specialize in vertebrate paleontology or paleontology, and in particular in synchrotron scanning of fossils. What got you interested in paleontology in the first place, and how did you end up shooting x-rays at fossils? Uh, I think I was saying I wanted to be a paleontologist because I liked dinosaurs as a kid, but then I realized I liked all sorts of old animals. And the synchrotron came for my PhD project. It was a uh, a situation of being at the right place at the right time. Uh, my master supervisor had tiny little fossil eggs from the early Cretaceous of Thailand, and he had uh, contacted Paul Taforo at the Synchrotron to scan, the, to give it a try on scanning these tiny eggs, and it worked. And then they both realized, well, this is going to be months and months of work. Let's find a PhD student. Could you tell us how this scanning of fossils works? So I use uh, X-ray computed tomography. You shoot X-ray at something and you record how the signal is affected. So X-rays are attenuated by dense material. So the denser the material, the more attenuation you will get. So that's why when you make a radiograph of your uh, limb or whatever, uh, you can see the bone because they are denser than the flesh around. So that's when you just do a radiograph. Computed tomography is taking radiograph at 360 degrees. So when we go to the hospital, the people are on a bed and the, the source and the detector rotate around the patient. But with the synchrotron, the source and the detector are still and it's the object that rotates. What is the coolest fossil you ever scanned? It is quite special when you scan a, an egg. Sometimes we know that there is something inside, but other times we have no idea. And like suddenly you see a slice and like, oh, there is an embryo. Last time I had that moment when we, we did that with the dinosaur Musaurus from Patagonia. We yeah. scanned that a few years ago with Diego Paul from Argentina. And he had like 30 eggs. It's like one at a time. No, no, no. And like, suddenly you get one. So I like that mo That's very special. Recently, a study of yours went viral on TikTok. <laughs> and uh, everybody's talking about these two dinosaurs in a burrow, and they're not dinosaurs, but it is a really cool story. So you scan the burrow of early Triassic uh, in age, so it cannot be dinosaurs. It's too old to begin with. But what did you find in the burrow? I was looking for a postdoc writing a project with people at the University of the Witwatersrand in South Africa. And they wanted me to scan um, vertebrate burrow cast. So like when you have this burrow, like the tunnel, and it's filled with sediment, so you have the cast. If you have an animal inside and you have a flooding or whatever, and you trap the specimen, I had like two burrows that I scanned. And one was a very nice thrinaxodon that had been described before and it's been uh, nicely prepared and you could see the whole skeleton and we thought let's scan it and see if there is more because the, it's nicely preserved and uh, so I was very excited about this one and my supervisor Bruce Rubich he went to the collection and found like another burrow but like not as nice looking like like it's a, basically a lump of rock and you could just see like the tip of the skull. It was like, oh, yeah, yeah, try this one as well. I was like, eh, sure. <laughs> and <laughs> so we started with this one because it was easier. Because it's completely surrounded with rock, we could just like put it in a tube, start the scan, and uh, and see how it goes. Because the other one was prepared, we had to find a way to protect the specimen during the scanning. So we thought like, let's scan the ugly one first. So at the time, we were having slices of. 18 centimeter in diameter, so which was basically the diameter of the burrow. And it was about 30 centimeter in length. And each scan was taking 20 minutes. So we started that early in the afternoon. And we were following the scan, like 20 minutes. We get, oh, yeah, we see the top of the skull. And it's like, oh, that, it's a very nice contrast, actually. So it goes down and down and down. And we get to the palate. We start seeing the teeth. It's like, oh, this is great. And uh, 
we see that we arrive at the end of the scale and we thought, let's continue a little bit more and uh, maybe we swap for the other one. And we wait a little bit more. And like suddenly in a, in a, we see another slice and there is something else. There is another skull with another set of teeth. They are completely different teeth as well. So it's like, well, this is not phrynexodon. This is not a, a therapsid. And again, like uh, you get like four millimeters. So it's like, okay, so wait 20 minutes, wait 20 minutes, wait 20 minutes. At some point, I think by the time we had like just a few centimeters of the other animal, it was maybe 2 a.m. in the morning. And we realized, well, it's not going any faster <laughs> just by staying in front of the computer, like waiting 20 minutes for uh, a tiny bit of information. So we just like, let's go to bed, come back tomorrow morning, 8 a.m. We are all back. And uh, we started reconstructing as fast as we can to get like the, the view of what we had done so far in 3D. And we discovered that there, it was a, a temnospondyle that was just uh, next to it. So yeah, that was like amazing yeah. surprise. Super cool. So so what is uh, the story of the burrow? You have the Thrinaxodon and you have uh, the, the Brumistiga. Uh, who dug the burrow? Who joined in later? Uh, there, there was a few burrows with Thrinaxodon that were discovered before. So the most likely candidate to have dug the burrow was the Thrinaxodon. On top of that, the Brumistega had poorly mineralized epiphysis. So you had just the, 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 the middle part of the, of the bone and like everything else was not there. Not that it didn't have any bone, but it was probably cartilage and didn't preserve. It was very unlikely that it had the, the capabilities of digging a hole on land with uh, this poorly ossified limbs. Yeah, don't, they don't sound like strong bones. No. <laughs> but yeah, so that was easy to discard. We think uh, the, the Brumisega looked more like a juvenile. So it was probably the Thrinaxodon burrow and the other one came in. And then we started to check, is that something that happened to animal share burrows? And we, so we started to dig into literature. And there's a lot of cases where, um, like you have a big animal digging a burrow and you can have lots of tiny animals using it. And usually the bigger animal don't mind too much. But it's not so common that you have, because like Brumistig and Trinaxodon are basically the same size. That's more rare to have two animals of the same size sharing a burrow. So we found a few examples. There was one um, in, in South Africa, actually, near the Cape, where you have squirrels digging burrows and they will have a uh, meerkat living with them. But the meerkat, they are better at alarming everyone when there is a predator coming. They are better at deterring some predators as well. So the squirrels, they accept that because there is a gain. But in that case, we thought like, but what's the advantage for the Trinaxodon to have a Brumistiga in his burrow? It's like, uh, it's probably not an animal that is very good at deterring um, predators. It's not helping with the the cleaning. I don't know. It could be like a, a little Disney movie. Yeah. It's a it's an offspring. It got lost. It's without its parents. And the Trinaxodon thought, I'll take care of you. But yeah, we discovered as well that the Brumistiga had... Um, a series of broken ribs and they they had started to heal so it's difficult to know exactly when it happened uh, but apparently uh, so we had a, a trauma specialist on the team as well um, so she looked at it and she said yeah that's something quite uh, brutal because it was like probably eight ribs all broken um, and uh, so they had started to heal so it something happened that was quite violent to this animal but it was in the process of healing, that's probably why uh, this animal was looking for some kind of refuge, uh, shelter, uh, because yeah, it was not in very good shape. But it doesn't tell us why the this one, uh, the Thrinaxodon, was accepting uh, a visitor like that. Like when when I keep looking for example like that, I discovered uh, that. Lots of small carnivores, medium-sized carnivores, and they all share burrows. And it's mostly, I think it's the badger that makes the den. And the other one, they just come in. But basically, they all use the shelter for uh, hibernation. 
in winter. So basically, the maker of the burrow doesn't mind that there are visitors because they are all going to be hibernating, and apparently that's fine. And when you hibernate, you enter a state of torpor, so your bodily functions are reduced up to almost nothing. So then when you're lying there, you don't really care that somebody else is also lying there. Exactly. It could be hibernation uh, because uh, especially South Africa was quite high in latitude. It was at 60 degrees north, basically where Iceland is. This is the, the Karoo in South Africa. This area is known for indeed suffering quite harsh conditions after the Permian mass extinction in the early Triassic. Yeah, this burrow sounds like it was dug to take shelter from harsh conditions on the surface. It was like a, a, an episode of CSI Triassic and trying to uh, understand what happened. There is an artist that made a comic of the story. And yeah, as you said, like recently someone made a video like being very sad that these two animals died together and were entombed for eternity. It's like, oh, and they were like sobbing over the 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 image and it's like what is happening and like it was like there was like four million likes on this video it's like i discovered like a few fan fiction more comic books more drawings and stuff like that so it's like people keep making art with it i think it's amazing i'm so happy you scanned the ugly burrow <laughs> <laughs> me too i mean like within a week we had managed to start the scan and have the 3d print of the skull of the brumistega so i had that in my pocket I was like, oh, I'm going to show that to my supervisor the first thing uh, we arrive, uh, I arrive in South Africa. And he, he came to the airport to fetch me. And uh, so I arrived at the airport and I didn't, I haven't told anyone anything. So it was like, oh, I'm going to just like reveal everything and it's going to be a, it's going to be a nice moment. And so I arrived at the airport and uh, we arrived to the car. And it's like, so he's asking, so how did it go? Did it, uh, did, uh, did it went well? So yeah, yeah. And then, uh, so he was about to pay for the parking ticket, and uh, so he, he was. Uh, so he put the ticket, and I just took the Brumistega 3D print out of my pocket, and I was like, "Oh, that's what was in the burrow." I looked at it, it's like, "No, that was that's that was the triangle." I said, "No, this was in there as well." It's like, "It looked," and it completely like froze, like, "What?" <laughs> and then because it took so long for him to just process what was going on, the machine swallowed the ticket. And so we were stuck on the parking lot of the airport <gasps> because it took too long to pay. <laughs> Thank you again so much uh, for talking to us, Vincent. You're a genuine rock star. Thank you, you too.